I'm going to show you some stuff later today that basically is representative, unfortunately, of the vast majority of soils across North America. Bricks. How many have heard of bricks? BRX. So the higher the bricks, the healthier the animals are going to be, um, and therefore epigenetically they're going to perform a lot better. So it, profound, it positively, higher bricks positively impacts epigenetics, positive epigenetics. So bricks is just simply a measure of the dissolved solids in the sap of a plant or in a fruit or vegetable. And those dissolved solids represent, yes, sugars. Many people think that we're measuring just sugars when we measure bricks, but we're measuring far more than that. We measure minerals, amino acids, proteins, lipids, and pectins. So it's really a measure of nutrient density, nutrient density in that soil or in, in that plant. And we can measure it using a refractometer, either a digital or optical type. Pretty simple to do this. You just um, pluck the plant leaf material. I form a ball with it, roll it around in my hand until I feel moisture on the palms and then put it in the reservoir of a garlic press or a vice press. And then we just squeeze out the sap onto the stage of a refractometer, hold that up to the sunlight and measure the bricks. But this is why bricks is so important epigenetically. Higher bricks forages increase animal performance and increase animal health, period. Higher bricks in the plants themselves makes them more drought tolerant, more frost and freeze tolerant, and greater resistance to disease and pest. Does every bit of that influence epigenetics? You bet it does, hugely hugely influences epigenetics. And we know this, we've done more than 20 years worth of research in bricks. The higher the bricks, the greater the gain's gonna be on our animals. With 3% bricks being our base, for every 1% increase in bricks in our forage species, over that 3% base, we get an additional tenth of a pound average daily gain. Now think about that. The same plants, the same pasture, same rangeland, I can have low bricks, moderate bricks, or high bricks, depending on my soil health and my microbial population. Okay? So if I can increase that bricks, I'm gonna increase their performance on the exact same forage species. I don't have to change forage species to have higher bricks. What do I have to change to have higher bricks? Soil health. Soil health, exactly. I have to change soil health to have higher bricks. This is taken from our research. You can see that as we increase bricks in our plant species, Average daily gain steadily goes up. It doesn't really tail off until we get up into the 20% the or greater bricks. This is research we did in uh, six different states where we looked at conventional grazing versus adaptive grazing on the same farms. We just split the herd, randomly split the herds and in a single season, look at what happened with bricks, plant bricks, just by changing the way that we graze. Now, why did it do that? Why did changing the way that we graze influence the plant bricks so profoundly in every single situation? Okay. Exactly, by using adaptive grazing techniques where we're built, so the ultimate was that we built soil biology, right? We built biology 
that then allowed us to build plant bricks in return. Even the stage of maturity at which we graze our forages can influence epigenetics of our animals. This is the sweet spot. Grazing at mid-stage maturity rather than highly, highly vegetative affords far better epigenetic impact, positive epigenetic impact in our livestock and in our plants and in our soil microbes, by the way. So in other words, the entire microbiome functions better when we target most of our grazing at this stage of our plant life. Did y'all know that? Our entire, the entire microbiome genetically functions much, much better here, but we're taught to do most of our grazing where? Right here, aren't we? That's what we've been taught. Folks, we've been way off, way off. And we've been harming ourselves epigenetically because of that. This is very crucial to positive epigenetic response in everything in that microbiome. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Grazing here. I move my cows every day. Yep. It seems like, well, this is my first year doing it. I'm putting them in on way too rank of forage. So the question was, what if we're on the other end of the scale and we're grazing here at late maturity rather than at mid-stage or even earlier maturity? All right, so here's the answer. The epigenetic impact of that depends very heavily on the degree of plant species diversity. If you have low diversity, then this is going to have a negative epigenetic impact to a certain degree. Now, however that being said, it is better than grazing here, okay? It is definitely better than grazing here because you have a far better developed microbial population here than you do here. But you can much more readily afford to do this and have a positive impact if you have greater plant species diversity. So the more diversity, the better able you're able to utilize grazing in, along this continuum of the scale. Make sense? So some things that I call too big to ignore. Uh, working again with this whole bricks idea. Stage of maturity of your forage when grazed. And the timing of your daily moves. So when should we be moving for optimum animal performance and optimal epigenetic impact? Afternoons, afternoons rather than the mornings. So we should be making our moves in the afternoons rather than the mornings. And what did we say about the stage of maturity of the forages? Between mid-stage and later, absolutely. Between mid-stage and later. Okay. If we pay attention to these two things, we can increase average daily gain in cattle between a quarter and a half pound per head per day just by doing those two things. We hadn't added any input cost whatsoever. We hadn't changed anything else that we do just by those two things. So again, some very critical grazing tips for, and this is no matter what species you've got out there grazing. Sheep, cattle, dairy cattle, even pigs foraging on pasture, chickens foraging on pasture. Know your dry matter availability and allow all your species to take about, or to consume about three to three and a half percent of their body weight in dry matter per day. Don't let them take more than 30 to 50% of the available dry matter in a single grazing event. 
You don't want them taking too many bites off the same plant. It's good to know that brick's content so you can graze accordingly. Turn into new paddocks in early to mid-afternoon, and again, the stage of the forage maturity, mid-stage to slightly beyond. Okay, selecting genetics for forage-based production. Here's the keys, folks. First and foremost, longevity. Any breeding herd or flock, period. Any breeding herd or flock, that's the number one trait. Not some EPD, not some DNA marker, not an EBV, not the pedigree, none of that. If you wanna make real money and have the highest level of net profitability in any kind of livestock operation where you're breeding animals. Now, if you were just a feeder pig operation, you didn't have sows, all of that, or you know, if you were just a stalker operation in cattle or whatever, then maybe you wouldn't consider longevity important. But if you're a breeding operation of any kind and you want real net profitability, longevity is it, folks. Bar none, longevity. Then up underneath that, fertility, soundness, and adaptability. So they gotta have high fertility, they gotta be sound in the feet and legs, the eyes, the udders, and teats, and the teeth. Now for most species to do that, particularly to do it out on pasture, that means low to moderate milk. We don't need, we don't need high milking beef cattle, and we really don't need even dairy cattle milking as high as they do. That's been to huge detriment of the dairy industry, as a matter of fact. They must be highly adapted to their environment. We're gonna talk a lot about all of this. In beef cattle, that means moderate frame. In terms of BIF frame score, height at the hip, bulls 52 to 46, cows 48 to 52. They gotta have depth, thickness, gut capacity, and survive and thrive without all the props. And we provide a ton of props today, don't we? A lot of props. But every one of those props does what? Cost, money. Cost us money. A lot. a lot, exactly. So, to reiterate, the four most important traits of any species of livestock that's a breeding herd or flock. Longevity, adaptability, fertility, soundness. But what have you been taught? What have you been taught? What kind of tools do you use for selection? EPDs. We're gonna talk about those in a little bit. What else? The what? I was thinking like how they look, I'm showing pictures. Okay. Big animals, heavy weaning weight. How they look, big animals, heavy weaning weight. More milk. More milk. Pounds pay the bills at the coffee shop. Okay, we've, we've been taught pounds pay the bills, right? Per acre is. Right, pounds per individual animal, but it's really pounds per acre, isn't it? that pays the bills. It's pounds per acre or pounds per whatever your unit is that pays the bills, not individual animal weight or even individual animal milk production if you're a dairy, okay? So now let's talk about all those things. What about EPDs? Now I'm a geneticist. I was involved in the 80s on the research and the development of EPDs. So I know exactly how they're calculated. I know all about them. But what about EPDs? How useful are they? In those four traits I just described to you that determine ultimate profitability, how useful, really useful are EPDs? Not 
Not that much. What, what is the uh, a definition of progeny uh, difference? Okay, very good question. What is the definition of progeny difference? So basically, it's a, it's a formula using an algebraic equation that predicts based on data input from parents and other relatives what the progeny should be relative to their parents in any trait. So weaning weight, birth weight, yearling weight, uh, you know, carcass traits, all of those types of things. So the ZPDs on each individual trait, and they are supposed to predict if I mate this bull with this EPD to this cow with this EPD, what my cat, how my calf should perform based on those EPDs. Now, do EPDs work to a certain extent in that regard? Yeah. Okay. Can EPDs be manipulated by seed stock breeders? Yes. Are EPDs manipulated by seed stock breeders? Yes, every day. I can take a high EPD bull on any given trait and manipulate based on who I breed him to and everything else to where I can tank his EPD and take a new young sire and I can dramatically increase his EPD. So in other words, I can take an animal that I want to, you know, because in the seed stock business, it's always the newest, the latest, and the greatest animal, right? You don't want to keep promoting the same old animal forever and ever. So they're always trying to build the newest and latest and greatest that's going to be the next million dollar bull or whatever. And so you can easily manipulate those EPDs to build a new one up and tear an old one down. It, it, it's not hard uh, to do this at all. It has to do with the data you report, who you breed them to, all of those other things. Even the environment that you're in can influence an EPD. So they're easily manipulated. I can tell you today that as a geneticist, I don't know an EPD on a single bull that we have and don't care. I never look at them anymore, ever. They, they have, they're of no use to me because I use these other factors that we're gonna to continue to describe and they are far, far more meaningful and profound in my genetic selection. But what's the first word? for an EPD, expected. expected. That first word isn't guaranteed, right? It's not a GPD, a guaranteed progeny difference. It's an expected progeny difference. But EPD, another fat fault of EPDs is that they're calculated on individual traits. What happens when I focus on individual trait selection Okay, over-concentration of that trait and we're gonna make bad decisions. You know, most people when they use EPDs, what do they, how do they think about using them? You mean in what they are it, selecting that, hypothetically that bull for? Yeah, so, so let's just use weaning weight as one of the EPDs. So let's use a weaning weight EPD. So most breeders, when they think about using an EPD for weaning weight, what, what do they want to do? Okay. Do you often hear them say, I want to be in the top 10% or 5% of the breed for EPDs for this trait or that trait, right? Yep. So what happens when you select your breeding stock, your bulls and all of that, 
for EPDs that are in the top 10% or 5%, you do what? Okay, so you, you influence size, a dramatic increase in size of those animals. But are there maybe genetic antagonisms among some of these traits as well? Yes. Okay, so don't, yeah, so the question is, don't we limit our gene pool if we're doing more single trait selection? And absolutely we do. Absolutely we do. So 